next on Unsolved Mysteries. An isolated factory in New Hampshire. A lone security guard. His car mysteriously burns up and he vanishes without a trace. A 15-year-old cheerleader is abducted. She escapes and runs for her life in a deserted cemetery. Rosemary Altea claims she has a rare ability to communicate with the dead. But can she? And one soldier saves another soldier's life, then they're separated by war. Now he wants to find them to say thank you. Join me for these intriguing stories plus updates on cases that were solved by you. I'm Dennis Farina and this is Unsolved Mysteries. Madison County, Ohio. A teenager runs for her life, trying to escape her assailants. She scrambles over a fence into a cemetery. A few hours earlier, she had been abducted and raped. Her clothes had been torn off, but somehow she'd broken free, only to end up hiding behind tombstones. She tries to get out of the graveyard, but in the pitch black, she smashes into a fence post. The men catch up with her. They strike her in her face with a blunt object and leave her to die. Her name was Jessica Lynn Keene, and she was only 15 years old. Investigators were able to pinpoint her final moments based on clues found at the crime scene. There was mud on the fence. A sock that belonged to her. And an impression of her knee in the ground. But the police didn't have a clue why anyone wanted to kill her. The savage murder of Jessica Lynn Keene has baffled detectives for years. Jessica was a popular cheerleader, an honor student, and a talented performer. Who could possibly want this young, talented girl dead? Jessica idealistically would have loved to have been a singer, an actress. I guess realistically, Jessica was loved animals and going wanting to go to college to be a zoologist. She was always laughing, always smiling, always singing, always fun to be around. Hey Susie, hey Jen. Hey. How you two doing? In high school, Jessica began to have her ups and downs. It had to do with being a teenager and with meeting her first love, 18-year-old Sean Thompson. Hey, Sean. But Jessica's romance began to distract her from schoolwork. I would forbid her to see Sean and said, you can't see him until your grades come up. You know, as far as her going to college, she knew she'd have to keep a good grade average in order to get a scholarship, and uh, her grades started dropping, and she had skipped school a couple times to be with Sean. Jessica wanted to get away from her mom. She thought about running away. I don't know what to do. But she didn't actually know where to go, and she didn't want to be a runaway. And of course, she's threatening, you know, I don't want to live with you anymore. But I, I knew I had to do something. Here we are. Arguments between Jessica and her mother escalated. They both knew they needed a cooling off period. They decided Jessica should spend two weeks at a local live-in counseling center for teenagers. I've got some questions I want to ask. Hi, Sean, what are you up to? The day before she was to move back home and just hours before she died, Jessica spoke to Sean. Jessica and Sean ended up getting into an argument that day uh, on the telephone, at which point they broke up. Numerous people witnessed this telephone call and, and said that Jessica was very visibly upset. After that telephone call, 
Jessica told a friend that she was going shopping. She was last seen at a bus stop near the counseling center. It was there that authorities suspect that Jessica was abducted. Yeah. Come on, hop in. We'll give you a ride. No, it's OK. Um, there is a chance that maybe it was somebody who Jessica kind of knew, maybe wasn't really good friends with, but familiar enough with them to trust them enough to get into the car, not knowing what would ultimately happen. Thanks, guys. Jessica's body was found 42 hours later. Yeah, Investigators gone. believe that after Jessica was abducted, she was held captive for at least six hours. Based on a semen sample, they believe she was raped between two and four hours before her escape from the car. This is the road here that uh, Jessica ran down after she was able to get out of the vehicle. I don't think she had any idea at the time that she was actually climbing into a cemetery to hide. But that was at that point, that was her only uh, means for getting away from whoever was chasing her. This is the area where they, uh, the crime scene investigators found one of Jessica's socks. She obviously lost it while she was running. The sock that was found matched one that remained on Jessica's foot. We do know that she hid behind this headstone. That was based on the crime scene investigators found her knee print in the soft ground behind the headstone. Dear Lord, please help me. We are uh, pretty certain that Jessica saw the light on from the farmhouse, and that's what she turned to run for when she collided with the fence post in the back of the cemetery. Because it's so dark out here at night, she uh, was not able to see the fence back here and collided with this fence post. Once she collided with the fence post, she knocked herself down. And at that point, her assailants were able to catch up with her. And this is the spot where she was ultimately killed. I've never been so passionate about anything that I've ever worked on in my life. The thought of this young girl, 15 years old, who had such a bright future, uh, being murdered in such a horrible, horrible fashion. Uh, you cannot help but want to do everything humanly possible to find out uh, who did this. Sheriffs in Madison County turned their attention to Jessica's boyfriend, but Sean Thompson wasn't in Columbus. He had left for Florida with some friends. They were ultimately returned to Ohio. Uh, Sean was questioned. Uh, the uh, friends that had gone with him were also questioned. And through the questioning, examination of physical evidence, we all but eliminated the boyfriend and the friends. There was no match between DNA evidence and Sean or his friends. For investigators, an entire week had been lost. The trail of the actual killer or killers had gone cold. What they, they did to her, um the fear that Jessica felt. She would do anything to get away. And I, I can feel her heartbeat running through the cemetery. I can feel the deep breathing she was probably doing when she knelt behind the tombstone. I can hear her praying. I realized that that was the worst thing that I believe anyone could go through. Update. DNA from the crime scene had been entered into CODIS, a national DNA database. 17 years to the day after Jessica King was murdered, detectives on the case learned that a DNA match had been found. The suspect was an ex-con named Marvin Lee Smith Jr. He lived in the area at the time that Jessica was killed. Smith had served time for rape in an unrelated case. In a moment, the story of a remarkable and rare escape from San Quentin Prison, done in broad daylight.
Located on San Francisco Bay, San Quentin truly lives up to its classification, a maximum security prison. Although few have ever escaped its walls, one inmate, Mark Adams, apparently beat the odds. Adams was behind bars for a cold-blooded killing. On the evening of the murder, three high school students entered a municipal baseball park located in the quiet community of Modesto, California. They gathered in a dugout to drink some beers and chat about school and their friends. Then, three figures appeared out of the darkness. In recent weeks, there had been other robberies by these ski-masked bandits. So far, nobody had been injured. Give me your wallet. Why don't you guys just leave us alone? One boy was dead, another wounded. An automobile spotted at the scene led to the arrest of the three robbers. The trigger man, 16-year-old Mark Adams, was tried and convicted. His sentence, 25 years to life. San Quentin is a fortress. Gun posts surround the three-foot thick prison walls walls that are lined with razor-sharp barbed wire. Over 3,000 hardened criminals, most of them repeat offenders, call San Quentin home. When Adams entered San Quentin, he was only 19 years old. He began his sentence under close scrutiny, but after six months, restrictions were relaxed. His privileges included a job as a clerk, and working with computers. Mark Adams was essentially a model prisoner. He worked uh, very well with people. He obeyed the rules. And he would seize any opportunity he could to stay out of his cell. When we had special projects where he had to work some overtime, he was only too happy to assist. I'm sure that Mark Adams took advantage of his position. He probably checked schedules. He probably checked timing. He wanted to leave no margin for error. Four years to the day after he was put behind bars, Adams obtained an authorized pass, allowing him to leave work early. Where are you going? I'm um, going to the dentist office. OK, I'll see you tomorrow. He left his job and walked to the security checkpoint, where he showed his pass. He was seen heading to the dentist's office. Then, he was gone. At 4.15 p.m., the inmates returned to their cells for the afternoon head count. The 4.15 count, when there's no hitches, will take approximately 45 minutes to clear. Inmate, let me see some skin. If something is wrong with a count, if there's one person that cannot be accounted for, most often there's a simple explanation for that miscount. You can't find any error then. You go cell by cell, bed by bed, with an officer and a picture of those people assigned to those cell blocks in that particular cell. Win. Good. 2A12, negative. No, I'm showing Adams in here. At approximately 4.45, Adams was confirmed missing. Immediately, San Quentin locked down. All access was sealed tight. Every prisoner was confined to his cell. Their few privileges revoked. An intensive search by correctional officers turned up nothing. No trace of Adams, no escape route. Authorities have three theories for how Adams escaped. The first is that Adams put on civilian clothes 
and walked out with regular visitors who passed through three armed gates. But to do that, Adams would have to show a photo ID at the first two gates. A second theory is that Adams simply went over the 25-foot prison wall. When an inmate has to make that move from a blind spot over the wall, he has to go from an area of concealment to one of visibility. It can happen in a matter of seconds. But in those few moments that it took to hit the wall and scale it, the officer's looking in another direction. An escape is perpetrated. It's rare that anyone successfully scales San Quentin's walls. Adams' chances were slim. Shortly after Adams escaped, three other inmates attempted to get over the wall. All three were immediately captured. We considered also in our investigation of the possible ways of escape is could he have gained access to a vehicle? It was possible that Mark Adams could have studied vehicles which do pass in front of his area of assignment. The third theory. Every day, approximately 225 service vehicles enter and exit the prison. Each must pass through a guarded inspection area for a thorough search. There is a remote chance Adams could have found a place to hide that took him straight to freedom. If there were a mistake in the security system, Adams would have been the type to look for it. He would have been the type to find it. And he would have made plans to exploit it. And as a result, that's precisely what he did. Update. Seven years after he escaped, Mark Adams was captured in Puerto Rico. He was returned to San Quentin to complete his original sentence and to face charges for the escape. A year later, Adams assaulted a fellow inmate. He was shot and killed by a prison guard. No one has ever found out how Adams escaped. Coming up, is it possible that this woman can communicate with the dead? Or is it just the wishful thinking on the part of grieving families? Rosemary Altea claims that she can communicate with the dead. She says that she can help families reconnect with their deceased loved ones. Good night, Rosemary. Have a good night's sleep, all right? Rosemary first became aware of her rare gift as a little girl in England. You would call them ghosts, but as a child, I just knew them as faces and voices. Which voices would be whispering and whispering at me. I would never quite hear what they would say. Sometimes they would call my name. It would be very eerie, very ghostly. And it was very, very scary. I was a, a, a terrified child. Mommy! Mommy! If I cried out in the night because I was scared, my parents would basically yell at me and I, I just was seen to be a, a bad child. Pull yourself towards yourself. You don't want to end up like your grandmother, do you? Rosemary's family had a history of mental illness. Her grandmother had spent her last days confined to a mental hospital. You know, as children do, I learned very quickly, very fast, to keep my, what was happening, my thoughts, my feelings, and my fears to myself. And I grew up that way, never daring to tell anyone because my greatest fear was that they would come and put me in a straight jacket. Rosemary kept her secret for more than 20 years. Then she met a man who changed her life. He told her that she wasn't crazy, she was psychic. He introduced Rosemary to other psychics and they began helping her unleash the power within. As we do, we start to breathe deeply. Rosemary soon realized that her powers were nothing to fear. A man's face. In fact, she could use them to help others. Most extraordinary eyes. 
suddenly everything made sense. Imagine that you are walking in a dark tunnel with no light for all of your life, and suddenly you discover the sunshine. Rosemary decided to dedicate her life to working with those who had lost loved ones. Eventually, she published a book about her experiences, The Eagle and the Rose. It became a bestseller. Would you send her a copy? It was at a book signing in New Jersey that Rosemary met Tony and Marie. Oh, you lost a little girl to cancer. At that point, we all fell off because we couldn't believe it. This woman, we had no idea who she was, knew this. I'll just take a seat right here. Two years earlier, Tony and Marie's three-and-a-half-year-old daughter, Michelle, died of leukemia. When the book signing was over, Rosemary tried to make contact with Michelle's spirit. She's really happy that you saved a, a card. There's a special card that you saved in a drawer for her. And the picture that she made um, that you have hidden in a box in the closet, she's very pleased you kept those things. For Tony and Marie, the message made complete sense. One of Michelle's favorite playthings had been a Valentine card Tony had given Marie. Goodness, that card, the magical love card, huh? It's beautiful. Later, when Michelle was in the hospital, a therapist helped her make a flower picture for her parents. It's a work of art they still treasure. My wife, my daughter, and me are the only three that knew about the card and a card in the closet that we kept. And I, at that point in time, I was absolutely convinced that this woman has an ability to speak to people on the other side. She's, she's quite adamant about her hands are on As we left the bookstore, the biggest amazement was trying to get over the shock of everything that just happened that night. I mean, I couldn't believe what happened. And upon us discussing it and talking about it, uh, I had a feeling of so much joy and so much peace that I can't even describe. I'm so pleased to be with all of you. Tony and Marie invited Rosemary to their support group, hoping that she could contact the loved ones of other members. Initially, some were skeptical. The ability to be able to be in touch with spirits was very spooky to me, and, and I was somewhat taken aback by someone saying they had the ability to do that. And he's with you all the time. Is that your son? And as she progressed around the room, she was identifying several people and their associated child and what the child died from. But the older one, she's older than any of the other children. And she was telling the right stories about the right people. And when she got to me and my wife, we were sitting there and she was saying, she looked at us and she said, your child died of a brain tumor. Rosemary was right. 20-year-old Stephanie Bozak had died of a brain tumor. She really is happy about the trophy. It's, she's very pleased about the trophy. I won a golf trophy at the country club two nights ago. Nobody knew about that. I was absolutely flabbergasted. I mean, I felt like I was really connecting with Stephanie. She was there in the room with us that night. And, and that uh, pushed me over the edge. That gave me the, the belief that Rosemary was doing something that uh, was real. She's looking at me very seriously. I just have a job to do, just like everyone else. My job just has to, just happens to be a little bit more extraordinary. To this day, Rosemary's powers remain controversial. Skeptics say that those who believe are just indulging in wishful thinking. Nevertheless, Rosemary continues to work with grieving families with the hope of bringing them comfort. Coming up, an unexplained fire, shadowy strangers, and a slowly moving car. Are they connected to the disappearance of a factory security guard? Seabrook, New Hampshire. Curtis Pichon is working the graveyard shift when his car suddenly burst into flames. Hello, 911. Report a car fire. Firefighters quickly arrive to extinguish the blaze. You all right? 
Yeah, you know, I'm okay. Curtis, a former police officer, tells the fire department that he has no idea how the blaze began. The firefighters notice he seems oddly relaxed. Then, just hours later, Curtis abruptly disappears without a trace. The whole disappearance is confusing. Uh, the car fire is confusing because even without the car fire, there's no clues here. This is a worse nightmare for any investigator because there's not that tangible lead and an entire family that wants answers and deserves answers and hasn't been able to get them. There was no evidence of foul play or abduction. Did Curtis purposely destroy his car as part of a disappearing act? But without a car, how did he leave the scene? And if he did commit suicide, where was his body? Curtis Bichon loved being a police officer. Then he was stricken with multiple sclerosis, a painful muscular disorder that limited his mobility. He had no choice but to turn in his badge. I've never seen Curtis so devastated in my life. His personality changed. He became sort of quieter. And I don't think even up to the time of his disappearance, he really knew what he was going to do the rest of his life. Hey, Chris. How you doing? Hey, how are you? Curtis became depressed and withdrawn. But when he got a job as a factory security guard, his self-esteem appeared to slowly return. At 12 a.m. on the night that he vanished, everything seemed normal. Busy? Uh, no, sir. Quiet as a mouse. Then firefighters in Seabrook responded to Curtis's call for help. He pretty much said that he saw a bunch of smoke and some flame, and he, then he went to find a fire extinguisher and then went to put the fire out. One fire extinguisher is not going to have much effect. We did notice that he did try to put out the fire, but I don't have any idea or gut feeling how the fire started or, or why the, the case ended up the way it did. When the firefighters arrived on scene, they had conversation with him, and they found him to be totally accepting almost. It was, he was not in the least upset. Curtis's calm behavior was puzzling because his car was filled with many of his possessions. He had the odd habit of using it to store what he treasured most. I would think that if uh, he had seen his car on fire with his belongings in it, that he would have been very upset. I would think he would have been almost in tears and shame. And I can't believe he was quiet, timid. After the fire was extinguished, the factory security supervisor checked on Curtis. Are you all right? Yeah. You OK? Yeah. He left Curtis at 3.25 AM. But 20 minutes later, a factory worker noticed that Curtis was missing. An exhaustive search of the factory and the surrounding area turned up nothing. Our very first thoughts about what happened to Kurt was that he could have uh, taken his own life, he could have wandered off, or he could have been abducted. One thing that we thought of in terms of trying to flush out this suicide scenario was the fact that he had purchased this pistol just, uh, I guess, a few days prior to uh, his disappearance. Curtis had bought the gun from his father, Nicholas. Suicide was a possibility with somebody in Curtis's condition. With MS, he had lost a job that he wanted all his life. But his mood on the weekend that he did pick up the gun and everything seemed to be more happy, more pleased with himself. I'm doing good, Dad. At first, Curtis's gun could not be found. Suicide seemed like a likely theory. I think I found what we were looking for. Once I discovered the weapon, I think that we eliminated the likelihood that Kurt had taken his own life. Now we had narrowed it down to one of two things. One, that Kurt broke down uh, mentally and had wandered off. 
And then the other one was, of course, uh, a much darker scenario where Kurt was abducted and probably murdered. Investigators next focused on the possibility that Curtis had a mental breakdown. He could have accidentally started the fire. And they became so upset over losing all his possessions that he simply walked away. There is absolutely no way that Curtis would have, or even could have, wandered off by himself under these circumstances. Curtis was a smoker. Smokers don't leave cigarettes. You don't, you don't go anywhere without your cigarettes. It doesn't happen. He had deteriorated enough that he probably physically couldn't probably walk two miles, let alone uh, want to do it. There are histories of individuals who we do not anticipate can travel any extended distance who, in fact, are located several miles away from their original starting point. I would tend to doubt it, but it is possible. It was also possible that Curtis called for a taxi or hitched the ride on a truck leaving the factory. But no cabs or company trucks left the plant during Curtis's shift. One disturbing possibility remained, that Curtis was abducted and murdered. I think Curtis went to work like he always did that night. And I think that he probably saw something that he shouldn't have. And he probably carried out his true duty of getting ready to report it or call it in. And he was attacked. And he couldn't defend himself. Investigators found that a door and two vending machines had been damaged during Curtis's shift. But no one knows who caused the damage. With regard to criminal activity that Curtis may have encountered, anything is possible. One individual that we spoke with took note about 3.30 of two vehicles departing the premises. My best guess is that somebody abducted him and did him in and disposed of the body in such a way that it hasn't shown up yet. I don't have much hope that Curtis is alive. I think if he was alive, he would have reached out already, and he never would have put us through this. It'd be very difficult if he had been killed in a plane crash, but I have no idea what happened to him. It's even more difficult. I miss my brother. I miss Curtis. I was his best friend, and uh, I, I miss him. I miss him very much. This case remains unsolved. Curtis's family and friends hope that he will someday be found. Curtis Pichon is five feet nine inches and weighs 165 pounds. He has brown eyes and graying brown hair. If you have any information about Curtis, please log on to our website at unsolved.com. Next, two stories that were solved by our alert viewers. On a previous broadcast, we told you the story of Joe and Maddie Harvey of Lewis Chapel Mountain, Tennessee. Sheriff Joe May was called to the Harvey house after it had been completely gutted by fire. He suspected arson. There were also traces of blood, and later he learned that $100,000 in cash was missing. Joe and Maddie Harvey were nowhere to be found. Curiously, their niece, Cheryl Holland, disappeared just a few days later. We have two missing people, now we have three, all out of a very close, immediate family. The favorite niece is missing. There's no money in the house, the arson, the blood, it all bills. And then the question is, is she really missing? Is she an abductee? Or is she part and parcel of a crime? When was the last time you saw Cheryl? It's like I said, when she dropped me off at Newport News. Authorities suspected that Cheryl Holland's disappearance had been staged. They questioned her common-law husband, Eddie Wooten, several times. Finally, he confessed. According to Wooten, he and Cheryl drove to Joe and Maddie's house with the intention of robbing them. Once inside, he shot each of them in the head.
Then he and Cheryl stuffed their bodies into the trunk of Joe and Maddie's car. They drove across the border into Alabama and pushed the car into the Tennessee River. Wooten claims that Cheryl returned to Joe and Maddie's house and set it on fire to cover up the crime. She then fled with her aunt and uncle's life savings, $100,000 in cash. Six weeks after Joe and Maddie Harvey disappeared, their bodies were recovered from the Tennessee River. Both had been shot in the head. Eddie Wooten was arraigned on charges of first-degree murder. A warrant was issued for Cheryl Holland's arrest on the same charges of murder. Update. Rollingwood, Texas. Less than an hour after our broadcast, Cheryl Holland was captured thanks to a viewer tip. She was arrested at this convenience store where she had been working for six months under the alias Amy Forrester. Employees of the store were shocked to learn about their co-worker's double life. The first thing I got to my mind, no, that can't be her. Not, not Amy. The only thing she said last night, she says, I'm sorry. I got myself into a mess and I will get myself out of it, you know. Four days later, Cheryl Holland was returned to Tennessee to face murder charges. Cheryl Holland and Edward Wooten were each convicted on two counts of first-degree murder. They were sentenced to life in prison. Mitchell Shigemoto was only 17 when he enlisted in the Army during the war in Vietnam. Under fire when his life was on the line, Mitchell would learn the true meaning of friendship. Since you ladies don't know how to march, we're gonna take a little run. Mitchell was the smallest man in basic training and the only Asian American in his company. From the start, it was an uphill battle. Due to my size, I was told that I could never make it being a paratrooper. So that, that in itself gave me the incentive to try harder. Are you like me? We started like about 800 men, and the graduating class was maybe less than 300. So, you know, it was quite an accomplishment just to get through it. It was tough being a part of the 173rd. It was clearly a, an elite airborne unit with its own special esprit de corps created specially to go to Vietnam, first to be deployed by helicopters in combat, and the only combat unit to make a parachute combat jump in Vietnam. Mitchell Shigemoto became a full-fledged member of the Army's 173rd Airborne Division. The unit was stationed in Okinawa before being transferred to Vietnam. Mitchell was all too aware of his physical resemblance to the enemy. That's where I initially started getting some problems because at that time in the Army, we got paid once a month. We got paid in cash, and I put the money away, and somehow, one way or another, it got stolen from me. It was common knowledge around the barracks that Mitchell was being victimized. Only one soldier, James Pearson, stepped forward to befriend him. Hey, man, we're going out tonight. Do you want to come with us? Pearson invited Mitchell to become a regular in his group of friends. They soon went everywhere together. You know, Okinawa is this uh, black section of town they call Four Corners. And I used to go down there with him and, and feel comfortable. And we could sit down and listen to the music. And as long as they knew that uh, James was my friend, I had no worries at all. The war had escalated by the end of 1965. Nine months after the 173rd arrived in Vietnam, they faced Viet Cong guerrillas on an almost daily basis. In one battle, a Viet Cong bullet tore through Mitchell Shigemoto's thigh. James was immediately by my side. There was one sniper that was keying in on us. James took a position right in front of me, just like he was trying to block off the shots, you know. James actually saved my life. 
James Pearson feared that Mitchell would die of shock. He and another GI defied regulations and carried Mitchell to safety. Mitchell had no idea that he would not return to the 173rd and that he would never serve beside James Pearson again. For many years, Mitchell Shigemoto and his family searched for James Pearson without success. Update. After our story aired, a viewer, retired Lieutenant Colonel Truman Plants, tracked down James Pearson in Chicago. James quickly flew to Hawaii to reunite with Mitchell. The two old friends caught their first glimpse of one another in nearly 30 years. <laughs> Mitchell! <laughs> How you doing, Bill? Great. God, it's great to see you. Great to see you. You still look the same. <laughs> I wasn't going to leave him out there alone under those conditions. I couldn't have did it. Well, regulations permitted it, uh, rules permitted or not. I just couldn't have did it. It took a lot from a, from a real special person to do something like that. And my wife, she, you know, when she heard that story, she, she made it a point to try to locate him with no success until we found you guys. <laughs> For James and Mitchell, the joy of being reunited is almost impossible to describe. They haven't come up with their words yet. <laughs> when they come up with that word, I'll write you and let you know. But there's no word for this feeling, you know, for, for right now. 